Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome back to Top Med Talk. It is our final interview here at Anesthesiology 2023, the annual meeting of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. It has been a fabulous three days here in the exhibit hall and in San Francisco. Thank you so much to the ASA for providing this beautiful booth here, this space. We've had a fantastic time. Wonderful conversations that you can find at topmedtalk.com. I'm Desiree Chapel. I'm your host, and I'm joined by my guest co-host, Guy Ludbrook. Guy, it's been a great three days, hasn't it? It's been fantastic. It's sad to see it coming to an end, but in fact, it lingers on <laughs> X and YouTube and all those things. So, That's right. Yeah, it'll be there for us for a while. <laughs> for actually forever, because we're talking about the internet here, so <laughs> <laughs> you'll never be able to get rid of us. Um, Guy, for our listeners that may not know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I'm an anesthesiologist from Adelaide in South Australia. And I work increasingly in post-operative care. I'm a health economist these days, and I work a lot with industry on on drug and device development as well. So a few hats to wear. <laughs> a couple, like like all of our guests and, and everyone here on Top Med Talk, we all wear a lot of hats. Our next guest is no different, and this is a, a guest that has joined us many times here on Top Med Talk, and it is such a pleasure to have her here, Professor Bobby Jean Schweitzer. Bobby Jean, I love that you're back sitting with us, and I think last year you actually were. Our last one, um, saving the best for last here at Tom and okay. Talk at ASA. Well, I, I guess I'm the closer. <laughs> you, are, you are the closer. That's right. Well, um, have you had a good meeting this year? I have. And it's great to see you again, Desiree. It's always a pleasure. And It hasn't you, been too long, has it? No, it hasn't been. <laughs> We've had some fun times. <laughs> we went to Ireland for the, the Dingle Conference, which is fantastic. Actually, all three of us were there yeah. this year. Terribly hard work it was, too. Oh, you know. My first trip to Ireland, and you know, I had to sample the gin, and I had to sample the Guinness. I and... think you, you became a fan <laughs> of Guinness, didn't you? I love Guinness. I don't even like beer, but I tell everybody Guinness is not really beer. You know, it's not carbonated. It, yeah. And I and love gin, and I never liked gin oh, before, really? okay. especially that Dingle local gin. Yeah, I know, the Dingle gin. You should look yeah. good, although we shouldn't probably be talking about that. That's true. No, no. And, you know. It was a lot of water. We drank two. Oh, well, I all types of beverages. It. We said we sampled We it. did, adult beverages. We yeah. sampled. So switching gears back to the ASA, great meeting so far, yeah? You've been busy. It's a great meeting. I mean, I think that, you know, San Francisco has turned out nicely. Yeah. There were some concerns around San Francisco. Yeah. Um, but I think that they've done a good job with the signage outside. You're directing us to the, the center, the Moscone Center. The weather has been lovely. Oh, you beautiful. Know? Yeah. yeah. One morning it was foggy and my hair got frizzy. But <laughs> <laughs> That's why my hair's up today. Because it was well, so bad. Honestly, You're fine. a guy. Yeah. I know. yeah, guy. I'm sure you worked really hard in that hair <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So you have been involved with the ASA and in lots of programs within and adjacent to the program every year. Is that correct? Yes. So I don't know. I keep at the time, you know, when I start to agree to do a panel or put in a, you know, lecture or I agree to be in a committee, you know, it kind of happens one at a time. And then all of a sudden it's like it's all come together. And I'm like, I don't have time to sleep. Uh, your schedule's like booked out every hour of the hour. But it's fun because I get to do a lot. I get to see a lot of people. I get to connect again. And I always learn so much. Yeah. You know, and it's one of the reasons I keep coming back to, yeah, to learn something. Well, why would you, if someone out there who they don't know you, which I find that hard to believe, especially as Top Med Talk listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Maybe even some of the organizations that you're involved in, because you, you too wear very many hats. Yeah, I don't like to get bored. Um, <laughs> so I trained in internal medicine, uh, practiced for a few years before deciding to go into anesthesiology. And that actually, I think, really set the stage for what I do because when I was an internist, I used to pre-op patients and do clearances and evaluate them for surgery. And I think probably within about two hours of starting my anesthesiology <laughs> residency, I wanted to apologize to all my patients and all the previous anesthesiologists. <laughs> <laughs> And let them know that I really had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody had ever trained me. And I, you know, so I be very rapidly became interested in this evolving field of preoperative medicine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started doing it, there weren't too many people doing oh. it. So that has disadvantages. You know, I always say, if you want to be successful, pick something that no one else is doing. Yeah. <laughs> no one else is interested in doing. And, and pay for that. Pay. actually turned out to be something that some, later down the line, people were interested in. A lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> and. I just happen to be at the right place at the right time, I think. Yeah. So I've been involved with ASA for some period of time. Um, I'm really thrilled that I think that the offerings here, the educational opportunities now, 
have really started to grow in the perioperative period, you know, that section of medicine, the preoperative space, and not just for, you know, risk assessments, but actually optimizations. Yeah. And, you know, driving science to really help us identify those patients who maybe should not have surgery. Yeah. I'm sure a guy's going to have some things to say about that, but at least need to maybe be better cared for before they have surgery, while they're having surgery, and after they have surgery. But I'm involved in SAM, the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia, a past president. I'm involved in Society for Perioperative Anesthesia and Quality Improvement, yeah. a past president. So thank you for asking about yeah. those. I do want to put in a plug. Many of the people that are involved in those are here. Yeah. They're a part of ASA as well. And SAMBA is a component society of ASA. Oh, okay. So usually I get involved. Since Saturday, we had a meeting. And I actually lectured at the military meeting of the yeah, Armed Services so meeting, which was a new opportunity. I was yeah. thrilled that they asked me. And, you know, it's so humbling to stand in front of these people who, you know, we all are taking care of patients. And we talk about how the, we don't have the skin in the game, right? It's the patients who suffer the harm and outcomes. But when you talk to these military guys, you realize that they are actually putting themselves in harm's way. In harm's way, yeah. To care for their patients even, right? Because they're in those those front lines. Yeah, and also your environments and things like that, yeah. Yeah, so that was really an honor. Yes. And then just here, I've had, I think, uh, two panels. I've had a refresher course lecture. I've had lots of committee meetings. (laughs) I'm the chair of the perioperative abstract committee, so I just wanted to put in a plug for people who please. The abstract site is not open yet, but it will be opening. We are always looking for good abstracts, particularly in the perioperative period. Uh And, you know, pre-op medicine, pre-op optimization, research, quality improvement. There's a lot of different things kind of encompass, you know, submitted to us. So look for us if you go to submit. And it's pre-op and post-op if people are doing post-op work too. As even, well. We call it peri-op yeah. because there's even things that you can imagine that are intra-op. You know, yeah. so, I mean, you know, the ASA could have pigeonholed things into categories, right? Regional, yeah. OB, um, cardiac, and like, critical care. And sometimes we're a bit of a catch-all because yeah. it doesn't exactly, <laughs> but that's okay. If you're not sure, submit to us because we can rearrange it. Like if we think it belongs in a different one. Mm-hmm. So we encourage people to do that. So and I'm the vice chair of the educational section for Periop. Oh. And that's where you submit for your uh, presentations for next year. That site is already open. And it's open until, I want to say, November 27th or 26th, sometime around there. Please don't absolutely <laughs> count that as the <laughs> deadline. I think you miss the deadline. Yeah. So go on site. But it is open for another few weeks. And there's panels. There's workshops. There's PBLDs. There's professional course lectures, Mm -hmm. there's snap talks, there's a whole variety of things. So please look at that and, you know, reach out to me individually if you want, if you have any questions about either of those, either the abstract submissions or the educational submission. Always looking for real world experiences and people out there doing it that may not have considered it before, but this is a great platform. Yes. And we really want to diversify, you know, and You know, we want women, we want new presenters who've never presented. We want people outside of the United States. Sometimes, you know, uh, ASA can be a bit U.S. centric. Yeah. So we welcome the, you know, the people from Australia and the U.K. and the Asian and South America. There's a large tendency um, here of international. It's very much so. Yeah. Yes. That's great. So, Bobby Jean, one of your passions, I believe, is, you know, caring for and really figured out how to take care of the frail patient and learning and understanding frailty and how that affects how they're taking care of in surgery, you know, how we prepare them for surgery, how we take care of them in surgery, and then what happens to them postoperatively. Did I capture that? (laughs) Yes, very much so. And it's not for unselfish reasons. As I get older, (laughs) (laughs) we're moving along that frailty. Every once in a while, I do a frailty assessment on myself to be... (laughs) No, but seriously, my mother lived till 98, oh, wow. and her sister just passed away to 106. Oh, my goodness. And so if I'm lucky enough to have some of their genes, I probably will pass into that yeah. frailty, you know, population. And I think that, you know, as we have an aging population, yep. and it's not just, I do want to point out, is you don't have to be old to be frail. That's right. You can be younger. In fact, there was a really great article that was published by Dan McIsaac and team out of Canada recently that I had an opportunity to interview uh, Dan for the anesthesiology podcast. And they looked at costs of care of frail patients and they found interesting and ironically, at least to me, very surprising that the younger people who were frail 
actually cost more than the older people that were frail. And at first I thought, yeah, maybe they just were killing off some of those older ones because yeah. <laughs> it didn't cost so much because they looked at, you know, yeah. interop and they pre-op, interop, and post-op care. And, uh, but they accounted for that. So they, you know, you would understand it more from your economics training of all the way they did the statistics and the matching and, you know, the cohorts. And, but they, you know, so I think that we don't want to overlook and think that just older people can be frail. Yeah. But um, I well, do think... You, wait, oh. Before we go on, tell me a little bit, and, and just for quickly, talk about what a young, frail person looks like. Because I think sometimes that's actually, you know, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, I think I know, but... <laughs> well, you know, so the first, you know, you're not far from that. The first, I think, most, if you ask people about frailty, is kind of like that Supreme Court justice who said pornography is hard to define, but you, you know, know it when you see it. Yeah. The way you have to look. <laughs> that's very telling <laughs> exactly okay so you know i think you know we think of the frail person as like you know that older person maybe has kyphoscoliosis using their walker using their cane having difficulty getting up out of a chair living in a sniff yeah. you know skilled nursing facility yeah. yes a skilled yeah. nursing facility but you know we have increasingly we have very defined useful tools Again, another plug for Dan McIsaac, who's done a lot of work on frailty in this. He, a couple of years ago now, maybe more, I always think everything's a couple of years ago, but he published an article in, I believe it was anesthesiology, I'm almost certain, that looked at five different measures, um, you know, validated me measures of frailty and compared them. And these things range from sort of the disease-based, you know, um, definition of frailty which is basically your comorbidities, mm -hmm. all the way to functional definitions of frailty and hybrid systems. You know, the original ones and the ones that we borrowed from the geriatric geriatricians were very heavily on functional capacity. You know, how fast you could walk or how long you could walk, whether you could get up and out of a chair, how quickly you could do that. You know, fall wrists, um, grip strengths, and um, that, you know, they, those took some time and effort to do. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, often hours. I used to say if the patient lived the geriatrician's <laughs> frailty, <laughs> then they'd be fine. They weren't <laughs> they frail. Were frail. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, that was cumbersome yeah. in the preoptive period. Yeah. And, they, and, you know, we don't always have that much time to do that or that much resources. And then it also, you know, we can't do that with telemedicine. So, you know... COVID came along. We weren't even seeing some of the patients, you know, in person. And then we have some, you know, patients we want to resource to just telephone visits or even electronic through our computer systems. You know, I don't think one size doesn't fit all when it comes to preoperative medicine. So I was thrilled when the frailty index, I believe I've got the right term, the frailty index was the frailty assessment tool that Dan identified as actually the best one. Because it was just a disease-based, comorbidity-based. So it essentially adds up, you know, hypertension, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease, OSA. And, it, you know, it doesn't get to the whole point, right? But what we do know is that, unfortunately, when you have all the diseases, you do tend to be functionally. Yeah, right? Absolutely. So you just, it's like so many things that sometimes we don't, Another test may add a little bit, a 1% or, you know, but the, is it worth the expense and the effort to do that? Yeah. Or do we have time to do that? So sometimes, you know, better is the enemy of good enough. Yeah. Or what we can design to that applies to 70% of our patients may be better than trying to get capture 100% of our patients, particularly when we're not doing well with most of the frail patients, yeah. I think, yeah, at this yeah. point. Yeah. Let's the start kind of the law of diminishing returns. I mean, you get mm -hmm. most bang for your buck, is that right, out of this? And probably less the when you get into the difficult to deliver kind of lengthy, complicated things. Have I got I, that right? I think that's said so much better than I just said all of those <laughs> words. <laughs> you summarized it very succinctly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So a, a frail person is not necessarily like you described as functionally just in in looking, they right, look no. frail. You could have someone who's actually obese or, you know, with a lot that doesn't look like the tiny little grandma. 
That's no. exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I'm sorry, you asked me, actually, this is what, you can't ask me two questions. Oh, it's okay. Okay, right? No. <laughs> but because you had asked me about a, what a young, frail person yeah. looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the young, frail people were often people who had a, a heavy burden of chronic disease mm-hmm. as well, often cancer, Yeah. undergoing, you know, aggressive chemotherapies. Yeah. Yes, malnourished, you know, sometimes, you know, substance abuse and tobacco yeah. use and, you know, uh, quadriplegia, yeah, you know, you or muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, you know, some of these diseases that we don't even see sometimes in older people because they don't live long enough yeah. to have those diseases. So, but in a, in a younger person, those kinds of diseases can result in significant, yeah. you know, frailty. So we, we talk about frailty and like functional reserve and things like that. What about um, of the brain and like how does the, how does all this work? Because that's one of the things we've talked a lot on but Top Med Talk in the past. We haven't we haven't kind of talked about it much lately. Well, you're asking me at a time when my brain's not working so well right now. But uh, <laughs> it's been a so, long day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's been picked kind of clean. Yeah. So you know, obviously brain health is so important. And I think brain health and aging and frailty all go hand in hand, right? They're like Venn diagrams of a yeah. lap. And it doesn't, you know, some patients who are not physically frail will have, you know, cognitive, be it cognitively at risk yeah. because of, you know, underlying conditions that they have, cerebral vascular disease or other things, or, you know, they have seizure disorders yeah. and they've had, you know, insults to their brain. We know that, you know, a, a, a damaged brain in the past appears to be a more vulnerable brain. Uh, but then, yes, the aging brain, you know, I'd like to think that it doesn't matter, you know, if you stay you, you know, stay healthy. You, I do my crosswords. I do, um, uh, what is Wordle? I mean, Wordle, Wordle every day. Wordle. <laughs> I do that other spelling thing that the New York Times, you know, I, I, I feel like at the end of the day, before I can go to bed, I have a whole other hour I have to run through my little games <laughs> <laughs> for your brain health. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm missing out on the sleep is like countering all that. <laughs> no, is this because I think, yeah, not getting enough sleep sometimes can, can contribute to that. But, you know, I know there are a lot of really good presentations here. Some of them I didn't have a chance to get to because I was too busy doing other things. But I do really, really think that that's so important. And it's so key to what we do as an anesthesia providers, yeah. right? Like, we are so fixated on the effects of our anesthetic practices on the lungs and the kidneys and the heart. But we forget that really the target organ... organ is the brain. Yeah. But I think it's that, that we've missed, you know, we haven't understood the brain yeah. nearly as well as we have these other organs. We can't test things as well. You know, we don't have the, the, the data, the randomized control trials, but, you know, we know that the it's two extremes of age, both yeah. very young, the older patients probably are at risk. I think the problem is, is that it looks like that still the overwhelming you know, population of relatively healthy older adults will still do well with most well-conducted anesthetics, but not all of them, you know? So there's a slice of even those healthy ones will have post-op cognitive dysfunction, delirium, or loss of what we ca- talk about executive functioning. Yes. And I think that's what's been sort of so hard for us to also appreciate that, you know, after an anesthetic, you know, you all feel a little bit woozy and a little bit fuzzy around the edges. And we tell them not to drive and make important decisions. And I've stopped telling people to stop operating heavy equipment <laughs> because most of us in the U.S. Now, oh. now, you're an exception. You have this farm and you have heavy <laughs> equipment. <laughs> they <laughs> exactly. So you'd have to keep telling you to stop operating heavy equipment. But I'm not sure it's wise for me to use that whether I've had an anesthetic or not. But anyway, that's, that's a separate issue. That's... I grew up on a farm. I can operate a little bit of heavy equipment. I used to think I could, but I don't do it routinely anymore. Yeah. But then, you know, we think we recover after that period of time, right? But we recover, like, to, you know, pay our bills, do our basic kind of functioning. But when you talk to people who function at a really high level, I remember I first had this aha moment when I was actually a resident back in Boston, and I had an opportunity to take care of some professors from MIT and Harvard who were these, you know, like Nobel Prize winning oh people and like function on a really high level. Yeah. And to a person when I would see them, usually it was in the pre-op clinic when I'd be interviewing them, they would say, you know, I'm not sure I was ever the same after I, oh. or it took me literally weeks, if not months. And they're like, you know, I could do basic stuff. Sure, I could teach the course that they te- taught all along. 
But when I was trying to talk to my postdocs, or I was trying to really like delve into some really, you know, complicated, sophisticated mathematical or economic question, yeah. you know, I, I didn't feel like I was holding my own the way I used to. So, you know, those were anecdotes. Yeah. But when I heard them over and over again, and this was way before people were talking about this thing, I started thinking, hmm, there may be something to this. Again, listen to our patients sometimes. Absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, they're very well attuned to the fact that they're just off a bit. Have we got, or are we getting tools to be able to better measure that and better judge that? Um, Or is that still a sort of bit of a stretch goal? I still, that's still, I don't think. So I think it gets to that, this, they they call it executive functioning Mm -hmm. of testing, you know, in this little higher level. I think that when patients are tested with those kinds of nascent tools, I, I believe that. This is not my real specialty, so yeah. I don't want to overspeak. I think we're getting and recognizing that that is generally when we're seeing the the people who are having effects, that by all other accounts, you know, they're not sitting there drooling or they can't get their, you know, dressed in the morning. Yeah. So they, by all, you know, they don't appear to be. So they're fine. Yeah, they're fine. I also think this stroke, the silent strokes and the increased risk of recognizing the patient's you know, you know, we weren't attuned to that because some of that was being overlooked because it looked like it was just a little confusion, a little delirium. They're not quite back yet. I'm going to tell you an anecdote if I can, a story. My next door neighbor was a CEO, PhD, University of Chicago MBA, well-trained, you know, smart guy who had retired. He was um, in his early 70s. He used to run, you know, five, 10 kilometers every day. On the lakefront, lived right next to me in Chicago. Lovely guy. Could talk about so many things, particularly wines. He was from (laughs) Austria. And um, one day he came back from running. I was out in my yard, I think, or giving the mail and over the fence. He said, you know, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. He said, you know, I've been feeling this kind of funny feeling in my chest. Um, you know, I used to get it sort of as I was, was, you know, at the end of the 10K. Then I started getting it like 5K. Now I'm starting to find I can't even go that far. I got to stop and I got to rest. And I said, like, you know, asking me for more questions. What's that pain? Is this sort of heaviness? I'm like, oh, oh okay. Sounds like, <laughs> like and you know, Yeah. I'm like, have you told your PCP? No, no, no. I'm like, I think you should call your PCP or I can get an appointment with a cardiologist. This guy had a cabbage within a week. Oh, my goodness. He was sane. He had a stress test, you know, lucky we have bedited yeah, things a bit for us. Failed his stress test miserably, oh, went to cath, had three vessels, severe disease, and had a cabbage. I went to see him, day post-op day one. He was in the ICU. He was still completely lined up with everything, but they had him out of bed, sitting in a chair. He was extubated, and I walked in, and I said, Werner, how are you doing? And he smiled at me. And I thought, you've had a stroke. Oh, no. He had the tiniest little droop of the right side of his upper lip. That probably no It was so it was. incredibly subtle that no one, and his wife didn't even notice it, but he said that wasn't surprising to him. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say anything to him right then. Yeah, yeah. Because I, you know, but I went out, I found his cardiologist, and I said... I know Werner really well. I've lived beside of him for 20 years. I said, you need to get a CT of his brain. He's had a stroke. They had a neurologist come and see him first. Of course. He had a huge field deficit, peripheral field deficit. So, And when they saw that, then they agreed to do the CT scan. They weren't completely convinced that I had noticed a tiny little droop of his lip. And uh, he had a shockingly large deficit. It was huge. Most of it was in the frontal lobe, some in the temporal. It was shocking. He had multiple occipital lobe, multiple deficits. Probably showered some emboli, you know? Mm -hmm. And he, to this day, doesn't think he has any vision problems because he's, you know, most people ignore their thing. And other than his vision problems, and this little droop, and interesting enough, his wife particularly says, and I've noticed a bit of it myself even, that he has a personality mm-hmm. change. She said he used to be, you know, incredibly patient with her and whatever, and now he loses his temper 
in a shorter, you know, I think he doesn't show that so much in public. But I think as some of these studies have done just, you know, routine CT scans and imaging and MRIs after, you know, surgeries just for other reasons. Yeah. We've been seeing a lot of strokes. Yeah. And so now I think it's tuned people into this. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that there's a lot more strokes. Yeah. After surgery. And even low risk, there was that 2014, you know, study out of, I think, the Netherlands, right? Some European country that showed that even with low risk surgeries, the patients who had had strokes within nine months of their, you know, non-cardiac surgeries had elevated risks of strokes. And even TIAs, pre-op TIAs, yeah. which I want to really call out too, because, you know, I think people say, it's just a TIA. And I'm like, that's like saying somebody just had a little angina. Yeah. You want to wait till they have an in myocardial infarction? To say that they're at risk. Yeah. Like, in fact, maybe the people who are in angina are more at risk because they have myocardium at risk. Yeah. They haven't already had their event and survived. Yeah, yeah. And so those people who are had those TIAs. So, yeah. I think that's another thing that, you know, we just need to be really cognizant of, like, protecting people's brains. Yeah. So we have these patients, you know, that are frail, that are much higher risk, that are really more apt to have post-op cognitive dysfunction. What are some of the ways that we as team anesthesias, particularly interop, can we take care of them? I know we've had discussion about like process EEG and things like that. So walk us through some of those things that we may be able to, you know, really avoid harm later on. And I don't know that we have all the answers yet. But again, I think that we have some signals that are telling us that at least these should be warning signs. That we know that, you know, hypotension interop is associated with major adverse cardiovascular events. Whether avoiding hypotension, of, you know, lowers those risks is still not... CBD. Yeah. <laughs> but I said that that shouldn't stop us from saying it's a marker, right? Yeah. Like if maybe perhaps if you've got a patient who's hypotensive, now that patient shouldn't just go to the floor post-op. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't just be sent home sometimes after a surgery. They should be monitored in a different way. They should be educated about things like warning signs that can be very subtle. You know, because if if we know it's associated, you know, then why are we then at least saying this is a warning? Just like we know that having ischemic heart disease or coronary disease is associated with worse outcomes. Necessarily, you know, revascularizing, particularly with stenting, preoperative doesn't necessarily lower your risk. But does it stop us from anesthesiologists maybe saying, oh, yeah, this patient may be slightly higher risk. I'm going to treat them slightly differently. Um, I'm, and I think a lot of it is actually not just intra-op, but post-op. Mm -hmm. I like to say that, you know, sometimes you're probably better off to go home after surgery where you've perhaps got someone who cares about you, who can watch you a little yeah. more closely. You no, know, I know, pick up on that little facial, you know, like the little nuance. Then unfortunately go to a hospital setting yeah. where you're on a ward with a poor nurse who has 15 patients she's trying to see, who can barely get around the ward to administer the medications and do vitals once the shift, who, you know, the cleaning staff is turning off the pulse oximeter alarm because it's bothering them and they don't even know what, yeah, what it is. Yeah. Which happened to me one time when I went up to see a patient and it was alarming. And pretty soon the woman who was mopping the floor went over and pushed it and said that this patient had asked her to keep turning it off for him because it was bothering them. Oh, no. oh my God. <laughs> It's also waking them up whenever. They <laughs> exactly. And just, you know, we've already heard today from the ASA, haven't we, yes. about this post-operative care issue we have, yeah. in terms of that focus and continuity from, from being in the operating room to post-operative care and, and the very issues that you're talking about because you, know, you can be on a ward, you could be on the moon just about. As you say, perhaps ironically, sometimes at home, the observations and attentions you'll get will be more. So, yeah, a lot, lot happening in this space, isn't there? Yes, there is. So, you know, even with the remote monitoring, right? Yeah. We can even send patients with the monitoring. But I don't know if you've already had Guy discussed, but I was lucky enough to hear you talk about some of the work that you had done already in Australia in this arena, taking yeah, care of patients yeah. differently in yeah, the post -op. I mean, it wasn't rocket science, but we saw signals of this. We knew that we weren't picking it up. And so we got people and put them and watched them yeah. closely. And my residents are driven mad because, you know, they have to see them on the clock and there's a board to make sure they've sixed it off and so on. And it works. And it really does. And what's kind of interesting is that we've got good data saying it works 
but it works for a long time. And we're seeing signals on, on improved recovery, less complications out for months and quite possibly mortality out to a year and a half. So, you know, what's going on mechanistically, as you say, what, what's actually happening? Are there inflammatory mediators that are going on here? I mean, that's, that's a really unanswered question. So, yeah, I think it's a really fertile area. And look, it's one we're familiar with, isn't it? I mean, that, that's yeah. our space. That's what we do. Just because the surge is no longer operating, we haven't got the gases flowing. They're the same issues kicking around. And, and I think we're terribly well placed to deal with that. You know, it's interesting you said it, but because, you know, we have known for some time that just having a perioperative complication, uh-huh. even if you survive it, increases your risk for some time after that. Mm. So, you know, po- uh, one episode of post-op delirium should not just be viewed as, okay, done and over now. Yeah. The patient recovered from that. They're fine, yeah. We know that up to a year out that that is a marker of, you know, worse outcomes. I think there's at least three big observational studies correlating quite closely that early post-operative complications and quite delayed mortality out to a year, two, maybe even three. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it may be association. It might be you're more vulnerable to complications, more vulnerable to mortality downstream, or there is a causative effect there and there's a preventative possibility. And I'm kind of getting a sense it's the latter, that, mm-hmm. that there is stuff that we can do. Yeah. And of course, you're, it's the frail ones. that, oh, that, that are, And so identifying those is incredibly important. So in, in your institution and in your experience of what's happening around those, who's doing that sort of frailty assessment? And I guess who's funding that too? Is it recognized enough to for people to kind of put the money out there to have it done? Or is that something we need to work? Oh, we always get down to the almighty dollar, right? <laughs> it's not about the cost. <laughs> Especially in the United States, right? And, you know, it's a couple of things. So we do a frailty assessment on 100% of our patients, 65 and over, or those that the provider who's seen the patient deems um, worthy of that. And we educate them around these kinds of things, you know, certain disease states, particularly decreased functional capacity in someone younger than that. And we, it's a, it's, it, it, we use the frailty index. So we have lots and lots of data and we are identifying. I want to also impress that I think that when we are evaluating these patients, we can do several other things too that can make a difference. It's a nutrition assessment. It's a cognitive, you know, mini cog baseline, you know, Social supports, yeah, we know that social sure. determinants of health are so important. And now, you know, with most, I would say m- most centers in the United States having electronic records, it's a shame that we don't have better, you know, sourcing of, you know, registries to pull this. And I know Epic, I'm not, you know, trying to pull a plug into Epic, but I just have that in my institution and worked in the two yeah. three previous institutions. They are developing some tools uh-huh. to help us get this data to better look at things like these outcomes for things. And I think, and you were both at, in Dingle, but, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we heard from Danny Levitt that in fact the NHS is mandating by the early part of next year that there will be a, a formal risk assessment, the kind of triaging process that has to happen all the time. Did I, I think I had that right. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. that's what's going to drive change, isn't it? If the recognition and the basic mandation um, and the rules around that to, to get this sort of change, is that going to help, do you think? I think it will. You know, I think a lot of actually preoperative medicine and medicine in the perioperative space outside of the immediate OR is being driven much more by countries outside of the United mm-hmm. States than it is in the U.S. We're still very, particularly, I think, in the anesthesiology world, focused way too much on the interoperative care of patients to the exclusion of everything else. You know, we, we do have anesthesiologists practicing pain management and, you know, ICU care. We are in charge of those patients in the PACU. But surgeons still really drive most postoperative care patients, and hospitalists do. And I'm not Dinging hospitalists, or but again, as somebody who trained in medicine, who I believe we were taught we could do pre-op medicine. Yeah, I believe sometimes it's misguided to think that hospitalists who haven't actually done specialized training in post-op surgical care really have the right skill set completely yeah. to manage these patients. And then I think a lot of the problem, at least in the U.S., is this failure with transitions of care. 
we're very isolated and silo, right? So then nobody's talking to the next person. Nobody's having this translate in to the next handoff. Our primary care doctors are outside of the hospital acute care settings now. So they're not even managing their patients post-op. So then they will say that the patients come back to them and they have no idea what surgeries they had because, you know, and they don't even understand the terminology. We use acronyms, we use abbreviations, and we use these, you know, sophisticated terms. And it's like, what is that surgery? Yeah. Like, what did they actually do to the patient? (laughs) <laughs> Did they take out an organ? They, or? Yeah, they don't need patients. Don't know. I don't know how to tell you what's happening. Right. Well, listen, we uh, we are wrapping it up. Oh they're going to close. We could have talked here for a very long time. I know. Time. I'm just getting started. I know. I know. <laughs> well, listen, one of the questions that the, the ones I've been dying, dying to ask you is we've had this conversation about what you do in pre-op and the assessments that you do and what kind of happens post-op. As a clinician that does anesthesia, I am focused on the interop piece. What are some of the recommendations that you give to take care of those frail patients? You know, I mean, advanced monitoring, different types of, you know, technology and and where to keep them, I guess I should say, on their vitals. So I think everybody, probably a lot of listeners are in very different spaces here, right? They're like, I do nothing. I know nothing about sort of how to start. So there was one article in the literature that was published in the surgical literature that I don't know how many people saw in anesthesiology that showed just simply identifying patients as frail when they did nothing else about it decreased complications, costs, and lengths of stay. And you may say, ah, you know, like, but it's that Hawthorne effect, right? It's that labeling. We label patients with allergy bands, okay? We still have to look in their medical record to see what they're allergic to, but we say, oh, that big red band that says they're allergic to something. We label them as a fall risk. And we know that these basic, simple things like that have made a difference. Putting something up on the patient's room that says they're hard of hearing or they yeah. cannot see well or whatever, right? So I think just start by having an assessment. And, you know, if you have an electronic record, it's it's generally already available to you, assessment tool that can pull information from your electronic record. Mm-hmm. Um, labeling patients as frail. Start to educate people that frail patients need cared for differently. Educating the patient and the family, is this patient capable of going home and taking care of themselves? You know, a lot of people now don't live close to their family members. They don't have family members to take care of them. We tell people they all have to have a ride home, but then we drop the ball. They just, we just get them home. Yeah. We don't tell them what else to do. So I think, you know, basic things. If you don't have access to a frailty assessment tool, there's two quick and easy ways to sort of Identify a group of frail patients. Any patient who's had three or more falls in the six months prior to surgery have a 100% risk of a complication in the perioperative period. Of course, falling uh, yeah. is a marker of frailty, frailty and not doing well. Activities of daily living. There was a very good study out of the VA that looked at activities of daily living, those who were fully functional, those who were either fully dependent on someone else or even just partially dependent on someone else to take care of themselves, bathing, feeding, dressing themselves. These were community-dwelling people, not sniff patients. Yeah. And they showed that those who were even just partially dependent on someone else um, had higher risk. It was like moving them, and they looked at the ASA fiscal status scoring, and it moved them into the higher ASA fiscal status score. So a two independent person was a, that two who was partially dependent was like a three independent person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think just looking at some really basic assessments and then making sure that, you know, you hopefully have some geriatricians and primary care doctors who can help facilitate in that, those transitions of care back. And then trying to engage your patients in shared decision-making about their goals of care and your surgeons about ask, you know, really engaging these patients about goals of care, because many of them, it's not about how long they live. It's whether they can continue to live independently, whether they continue to drive if they're driving, if they're going to make it to their, you know, great granddaughter's graduation. Yeah, and that's what's important to them. Yeah, and so many of them don't understand. We really don't spend time telling them how long it's going to take them to recover from this total joint. So even sometimes the timing of surgery is not ideal. 
Yeah. Because they think they're going to, oh, it'll be home in two weeks and back. Yeah, every week. Back back back. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, I could go on and on, but I think that, you know, depends on where you're at. But a lot of geriatricians are very interested in helping us in this space. So try to find a geriatrician. Try to find a champion surgeon who's, you know, willing to work with you. And you can start small. Again, identifying patients, getting you nutritionists yeah. involved in these patients. You know, just simply giving a patient like three weeks of insure pre-op yeah. who's nutritionally deficient is has been shown to lower risk and complications. And some of these older patients live alone and they don't eat so well, yeah. right? Yeah. They don't taste as well. They don't have good yeah. teeth. They don't like to cook for themselves. Yeah. And, you know, I'm guilty of that. I don't like... I know, I know, I do, I, and it's the same. But you know, too, like you know, as someone who's you know giving the medications, doing monitoring, all these things, uh, like we have to make sure we're not you know over medicating or giving medications that actually cause issues, right? Or you know, yes. monitoring their brain. <laughs> I do have a moment to say something else, and thank you. And I think you asked me this at the very beginning, and then you came back, especially speaking to the interop. I think this idea that you know. It's okay to give everybody a general anesthetic or that we give sedation that is really a general anesthetic, but as we call it sedation, <laughs> yeah. is very problematic. We do know that, you know, using midazolam, for example, increases the risk of falls. Yeah. Not just whether it increases delirium or not, because I think it's still out to debate whether one dose of midazolam increases the risk of post-up delirium. One dose of midazolam has been shown to increase the risk of patients who fall and break a hip. Do they really need midazolam? A lot of these, you know, patients are happy to sit and talk to you. They're lonely and a little TLC. Yeah. And I do think with brain monitoring, we should consider using it because I think there's some evidence in the literature that if you don't keep these people at very deep levels of anesthesia, they have lower risks of post-op delirium and cognitive dysfunction. And even for sedation, you know, some of the studies that looked at sedation showed no difference with general anesthesia, but it's because those patients were essentially given general anesthetic. Given, given general anesthetic or a deep yeah. sedation. Mm -hmm. And do they really need that? You know, they go to their dentist and they don't get sedated. They go and have these lengthy geriatrician evaluations. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I always think for eye, sur like cataract surgery, Patients have told me that the evaluations our ophthalmologists do before they come for their cardiac surgery is lengthier. Way worse. And more stressful. Right. And way worse than the cataract surgery. Yeah. Yeah. True. So fascinating. I love hearing from you. You're so passionate about the topic, and that's what we need to keep to keep pushing these messages for us to understand what we need to do to take care of these this very special patient population. So. But just Guy and I are getting closer to that. We need you, Desiree. We need you. <laughs> okay. well, in Australia, you know what the definition of old age is? No. Someone five years older than your boss. So, you know, it, it's a moving field. It's so, a you know, we're going to stay a puppy for a while, I think. You know. I like there it. you go. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming back here on Top Men Talk. It's always such a pleasure. And Guy, thank you for sitting in this weekend it's been with quite us. quite wonderful. It's been, so it's much been an absolute yeah. honor, actually. Yep. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for hanging with us here at Anesthesiology 2023. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you. You keep us going. Listeners all over the world, keep us doing this because it is a lot of fun, but it's wonderful to know that we um, can share all these wonderful conversations with you wherever you are. So thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you so much to our sponsors, G Healthcare, Edwards Life Sciences, Medtronic. We can't do it without you. So thank you so much for that. Everyone have a great day and we'll catch you on the next one. Cheers, everybody. Bye, everyone. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.